the serotonin 2 uh, paradigm, uh, it, it became the uh, paradigmatic receptor over 30 years ago, during a period in which pro prohibition led to the study of psychedelic drugs in rodents, when most of the drugs of this study had not been invented, when an adequate body of subjective human data on diverse psychedelics could not be assembled, when reliable affinity screening at a broad panel of receptors was not possible, when our knowledge of neurotransmitter diversity was dramatically incomplete, only two of 14 serotonin receptors were known, and a decade before serotonin-7 was discovered, this led to a premature convergence on serotonin-2. We need to take a fresh look at psychedelic receptors. So the National Institute of Mental Health Psychoactive Drug, drug Screening Program approved my request to assay 25 psychedelic drugs broadly. They were assayed at 51 receptors, transporters, and ion channels. I collected similar data from the literature on 10 other drugs, seven of which also assayed by the PDSP. I'll make a number of generaliz generalizations. Such and such a drug is the most this or the least that. That only applies to the 35 drugs of my study, though more often than not, only to this subset of 22 drugs. So my method is the synthesis of the molecular affinity data with the human natural history, the uh, subjective experience reports. This led me to the concept of mental organs, not a new concept, but I defined it as a population of neurons expressing specific modulatory receptors, such as serotonin-7, histamine-1, alpha-2C. These populations are tuned to a specific mental function. There's potentially one mental organ for each of more than 300 modulatory receptors expressed in the human brain, but actually we don't know how many there are because we don't even know if every modulatory receptor defines a mental organ. Uh, because receptors define mental organs, the term receptor and mental organ are somewhat interchangeable, but I'll tend to use receptor when I'm talking at the molecular level and mental organ when I'm talking at the mental level. So the, the topic is depth and breadth. Let's just get into it. Uh, depth is uh, the, the degree of activation of the serotonin-7 receptor, which defines consciousness itself, and that's measured in this graph as relative affinity at serotonin-7. Breadth is, is the number of mental organs held in consciousness at any time, and that's measured in this graph as, as the breadth of interaction of each drug at all the receptors assayed. So I'm going to represent the mind, consciousness, with this brain icon. This pink brain doesn't represent the brain. It rep represents the conscious mind as mediated by the serotonin-7 mental organ. And I'll usually leave the serotonin-7 off. So just the pink brain thing, mind. So uh, this is the uh, resting state, the unmedicated mind, which can be expanded by the activation of serotonin-7. Now, I haven't said what that means. I'll get around to it. I'm just explaining my, my uh, visual representation. Breadth of consciousness is the number of mental organs that are being held at any time in consciousness. This is a lot of breadth. We've got sigma, imidazoline, alpha, dopamine, uh, and histamine, which is more than if just imidazoline were, were being held in consciousness. So breadth uh, can vary. I've characterized 13 mental organs, and I can categorize them uh, into content mental organs, which collectively constitute breath, and mechanisms of consciousness. So we've got the hands of the mind, serotonin-2, which help to shape breath, and we have the mental space, serotonin-7, which is depth itself. I want to start with uh, the content mental organs. I'm going to give a very quick survey of them, because I just don't have time to really go into depth. But we can think of them as ways of knowing. Each content mental organ paints a different facet of reality in consciousness. And interestingly, content mental organs can be in consciousness or out of consciousness. More content mental organs in consciousness means greater breadth and a representation of reality that is more multifaceted, more complete. Uh, tour of the, the uh, content mental organs beginning with the cognitive mental, mental organ, which mediates language, logic, and reason. Serotonin-1 is the cognitive mental organ. Uh, I, I'm going to have these bar diagrams where I represent the affinity data in de decreasing rank order of affinity. Uh, here's the list of the receptors on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is four orders of magnitude of affinity data. No individual drug uh, had affinity data, data over more than four orders of magnitude, so I set the, the top of the scale at four, and we see uh, aff uh, affinity dropping away uh, as, uh, as we go down the list. The rough limit of perceptibility is two orders of magnitude of affinity. So I've drawn this heavy vertical bar representing, uh, separating those uh, uh, receptors that we can't perceive during the drug experience and those which we can. Uh, 
DOAT it has its best hit at serotonin 1, uh, and here's an here's a experience report. I worked on some problems in my software. A certain problem had been plaguing me for the last two days. I had been putting in patches all over the place to fix the problems. Now I stumbled onto an elegant solution which made the problem evaporate. I replaced two pages of code with five elegant lines, and I was able to go back and pull out all the patches. Cognitive enhancement. Uh, serotonin 1 is the basis of LSD microdosing. If you take the full dose, you should be able to perceive all of these receptors, but when you microdose, you only perceive the top receptors. Three of the top five are serotonin 1, and one of them is also serotonin 7, which adds the spark of creativity and takes it to a higher level. The affected mental organs are numerous and non-serotonin. I'm going to uh, review, review just a few of them. Imidazoline is the best hit of MDMA. It's also important to the pharmacology of mescaline. It mediates ecstasy, empathy, openness, compassion, peace, acceptance, healing, oneness, caring, forgiveness. Not the gesture of forgiveness, but the true letting go on one's heart of anger, grudge, guilt, or shame. Letting go of anger and grudge implies forgiving another. Letting go of guilt or shame implies forgiving oneself. And this emotional unburdening can be healing. Uh, it, 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 imidazoline mediates uh, the ability to safely experience, contemplate, talk about, and process mental pain, which can be healing. Beta, uh, DOM, and LF2 are, are the uh, cleanest beta drugs. Uh, the French term joie de vivre uh, captures the, the, the nature of beta. Exuberance, joy of living, love of life, joy of conversation, eating, joy of anything one might do, uh, refinement, grace, elegance, uh, success, joy of summer, joy of an embrace, joy of friendship, the sense of happiness, joy, elegance, luxury, the feeling of a fine brandy, the sense of the season when all the fruits ripen, the feeling of the bustle in the street, coming home to your mother's arms, the feeling of the smoke from the chimney when dinner is cooking, the joy of cooking. Alpha 2. Uh, shows us the essential nature of things. Uh, mescaline's best hit is alpha-2, and it's, uh, it's the, prom uh, the dominant flavor of DOI. Uh, Ramachandran found a Sanskrit word that, that captures the nature of this, capturing ras rasa from Sanskrit, capturing the very essence, the very spirit of something. Osman's description of mescaline, a plain wooden chair was invested with a chariness, which no chair ever had for me before. Barbed wire on a fence outside was sharp and bitter, a crown of thorns, man's eternal cruelty to man. It hurt me. Alpha 1, the sense of the flow of events from the past through the present and into the future. The sense of history. The sense of the unfolding coherence, continuity, liveliness, and vitality of a scene. Histamine 1 is a special kind of memory. It's a cumulative, effective theory of mind. When we interact with somebody, we, we have a theory of mind that they have a mind of their own. We have an idea of what's going on in, in that mind. But histamine isn't telling us what they're thinking. It's telling us their, their, their heart, their essential nature. Uh, and with each interaction, we're building a model. We're refining and elaborating that model. So people who we interact with uh, through the lifetime, we, we've constructed a complete model of their heart, uh, which we hold in this special memory. Uh, description of the experience from TMA2, the, the cleanest uh, histamine drug. What seems absolutely unique with this experience is its connection to other people. When I think of my mother, it is as if her presence is with me in three dimensions. It is not that I see her. Actually, I see, I see below the surface. Her essence is with me. There was a kind of three-dimensional representation of her, but it didn't have the facial structure. It had her inner being. So uh, those are the content mental organs. Let's move on to the mechanisms of consciousness, beginning with serotonin 2, the hands of the mind. Uh, MEM and DOB are the only drugs of the study that are purely selective for the, the serotonin 2 receptors. <clears throat> I'm going to describe moderate doses of these drugs, which is kind of the sweet spot for uh, DOB. Relax, no worries, warm, stable, felt good. But that's the most I felt. It's not rich at all, kind of boring. After I was down to the baseline, I noticed the world was more expansive and more connected and richer than what I felt when I was high on the drug. Moderate dose of MEM. The things I really care about were closer to me, and the things that don't agree with me were more distant. Now when we go to a higher level, a uh, high level of MEM, I could not muster one single thought in my brain or feel anything. Being unable to think was so obvious that it upset me. I felt my brain was empty, blank. Uh, and Shulgin's description of high DOB, there was a gray iron weight on my soul. The image I'm getting is a, of an awful cosmic indifference. My abstract says, selective serotonin 2 agonists are not psychedelic in any conventional sense. My bad. I meant to say, selective serotonin 2 agonists are not psychedelic in any conventional sense. So this led me to, to, to uh, see the serotonin 2 spectrum in this way. 
Uh, serotonin 2 is a gatekeeper to consciousness. And activation of serotonin 2 closes the gates. Relax, relaxation of serotonin 2 opens the gates. Normally, we're caught up in our thoughts and feelings, but if we activate serotonin 2 a little bit, we get enough distance from that for some insight or introspection. If we go a little further, it's tranquil, serene, solid, and this is the sweet spot. If we go further than that, we come effect, be, become effectively and cognitively distant, and eventually the mind becomes completely closed. And I suspect that this may be part of the SSRI mechanism. If we go in the other direction, we go beyond being caught up in thoughts and feelings to becoming overwhelmed and under assault by thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, and I suspect that this may be where autism lies. So this led me to see that the dramatic effects of psychedelics come from everything but serotonin 1 and serotonin 2. Serotonin 2 is anti-psychedelic because it closes the gates of consciousness. Now, I held this view for a decade until I contemplated the natural history of clonidine, a blood pressure medication. Clonidine uh, acts at, serot uh, at alpha-2 and imidazoline, the same receptors that uh, mescaline and MDMA act at, but it's not psychedelic because it doesn't act at serotonin-2. So then I realized that while all of this is true, it's also true that serotonin-2 is psychedelic because it holds other mental organs in consciousness. So here I've represented serotonin-2 as a hand, and it's holding imidazoline in consciousness. This is the mechanism of action of, ser of, of uh, serotonin-2. So serotonin-2 can still be a gatekeeper, but I'm going to replace the gatekeeper uh, icon with the hand icon. There's still a spectrum in terms of the strength of the hand, but the hand is dexterous. It, it can do more than one thing, and it can do different things at the same time. So, for example, here's a hand filtering access to consciousness as the gatekeeper. This one is focusing attention. This one is bringing something into consciousness. This one is holding something in consciousness, and this one is blocking a memory from consciousness. So, uh, it led me to these hypotheses. In order for a content mental organ to enter consciousness, two things must happen. The content mental organ must be activated directly at its defining receptor, so imidazoline or alpha-2, uh, beta, histamine. The mental organ must be held in consciousness by simultaneous activation of serotonin-2, the hands of the mind. Well, let's look at how this works. So here's the unmedicated resting state. There's the hand there acting as, as gatekeeper to consciousness. We add MEM selective for serotonin-2. So it strengthens the hand. It filters more out, depending on, on dose. Or, on the other hand, if we add the blood pressure medication, realmenidine, it activates uh, imidazoline receptors in the brain and lowers blood pressure. It's not psychoactive. So I've drawn the eye outside of the brain. It doesn't, it doesn't enter consciousness. On the other hand, if we take MDMA, it activates the same imidazoline as realmenidine, and it activates the same serotonin 2B as, as MEM at the same time, and uh, imidazoline is held in consciousness. So we get the intactogenic experience of MDMA. Now, if this mechanism that I'm, I'm describing is true, then we ought to get the same results from taking MEM together with realmenidine. So I propose this uh, hypothesis published it a year and a half ago, constructing the ecstasy of MDMA from its component mental organs, proposing the primer probe method. Since the publication, reports have begun to appear. The result was spectacular. I got a plus four experience from a pure imidazoline blood pressure medication. It is probably the intactogenic core of MDMA. I was astonished by the depth of the experience, and I remained astonished for two weeks. The mental state was ecstatic, somewhat unsober. I recalled Martin Ball calling 5-methoxy-DMT the crown jewel of the entheogens. I felt that real menadine must also be a crown jewel. I described the state with superlatives. It is like a peaceful lake. It feels eternal. I spoke to my wife about what, for me, were the core issues in our relationship. These are things that are very hard to discuss because they are painful, and discussion tends to lead to anger. But, but we discussed it peacefully. I expressed my sadness with tears. I believe this capacity for calm contemplation and discussion of painful personal issues is a core feature of the intactogenic state of MDMA. And here I was experiencing it with blood pressure medication. For me, for, for me it's really astonishingly among the best psychedelic experiences I've ever had. Unbelievable. <clears throat> So the primers, for experimental purposes, ought to be drugs uh, with little flavor of their own. Uh, so that would be either the pure serotonin-2 drugs or the serotonin-1, serotonin-2 drugs, so MEM-DOB for serotonin-2, or the serotonin-1 and 2 drugs, 2CB-FLY or DOET. 
the probes can be anything that activates non-serotonin receptors, so the content meant organs. So lots of medications do that. We've got uh, blood pressure medications, one for imidazoline, one for alpha-1, Parkinson's medication for dopamine, and decongestant bronchodilator for beta, antivertigo medication, uh, vertigo medication for histamine-1, cough suppressant or anesthetic for sigma. Now, the fact that these ordinary uh, medications, and probably many others, are now fully psychedelic, should cause some serious problem for Britain's new Psychoactive <laughs> Substances Act. Uh, what's more, it makes possible the, the development of second-generation psychedelics. The primer probe uh, me mechanism method is an adaptation of the ayahuasca principle of, of uh, t uh, bringing together two drugs which uh, by themselves are non-psychoactive or marginally so, but when brought together in combination are fully psychoactive. Although, to my knowledge, it hasn't been tried yet, it should be possible to combine multiple probes in varying proportions to confect the flavor of a drug with an ease and control that would never be achieved through synthetic chemistry. As proof of concept, I propose the creation of second-generation pharma ecstasy uh, that would have no toxicity, reduced tendency to induce chronic tolerance, cleaner, more targeted receptor profile with reduced side effects, and different versions with different durations, different versions with fine-tuned, individualized, qualitative, intactogenic properties, depending on what other probes were added to imidazoline. I believe that we should be able to do the same with ibogaine, producing a farm iboga with similar goals, but using a different primer mechanism. So let me uh, explain what I think is the therapeutic mechanism of MDMA. So here's a hand blocking something from consciousness. Let's peek inside to see what that is. Okay, that's a trauma. Maybe this is a veteran. That trauma is too painful to hold in consciousness. It's not safe. That would uh, uh, worsen the trauma or re-traumatize. But if imidazoline is held in consciousness, uh, then it should be, uh, it, then it is possible to hold the, the trauma in, uh, in consciousness, to process it, to talk about it uh, in, in therapy, and that uh, uh, MAPS has shown is healing. So we've been talking about breadth of consciousness, which is the number and diversity of content mental organs held in consciousness. It's shaped by serotonin 2 in interaction with content mental organs. Uh, so we finished that. Let's move on to the mental space depth. Let me contrast depth and breadth. Consciousness can be expanded through breadth, which provides a more complete and multifaceted experience of actual reality, that which actually exists internally, externally, or socially. Consciousness can be expanded by depth. This adds the spark of creativity and allows us to go beyond actual reality, using our imagination, our creative capacity to add to actual reality, to add novelty generated by our mind to that which actually exists, to consider not just what is, but also what could be. So this uh, quote represents what I think uh, is the function of serotonin-7 in the healthy, unmedicated mind. It's a quote from Charlotte Bronte by Jane Eyre, in which the parson St. John describes the role of religion in his life. He says, from the minute germ natural affection, she has developed the overshadowing tree philanthropy. From the wild stringy root of human uprightness, she has reared a sense of, do, uh, a sense of the divine justice. Serotonin-7 takes it to a higher level. Serotonin-7 activation alters anything that enters consciousness. Uh, there seem to be common themes to its effect. It adds a creative exuberance. It takes it to a higher level. It makes connections. It comprehends the bigger picture. It creates sumptuousness, sparkle, grandeur, majesty, transcendence. The intangible held in consciousness becomes tangible, as if perceived through the senses. Thus, thoughts, feelings, or motivations originating from within may be perceived to originate from without. Anything held in consciousness becomes rendered at a higher resolution, by which I mean greater subtlety, nuance, complexity, tangibility, vividness, and capacity of thought, feeling, and sensory input. It feels like genius. It lifts the spirits, and the sense of self beca can become thin or disappear. It can produce the sense of something greater than oneself, a greater power when combined with dopamine, the sense of God, the sense of cosmic, as in from the galaxies down to the subatomic particles. Uh, Alex Gray said, you are one with the same force that provides the spiral arms of the galaxy. That universal creativity is also what you are as well. This is serotonin-7 thinking. Uh, it produces, in a variety of ways, it produces a sense of autonomy, such as the creation of alternate worlds populated by entities. You may, may find yourself uh, making non-volitional movements or vocalizations as if possessed by a, 
uh, an autonomous uh, force. Uh, you may feel yourself being imparted uh, knowledge by an autonomous source. You may be immersed in power, such as within uh, uh, an atomic explosion. You may feel that the mind exists independent of the body, uh, or before or after the body, or could, could transcend the cycle of birth and death, death, as illustrated by this Moody Blues album cover. Serotonin 7 mediates the most dramatic effects of psychedelic drugs, including open-eyed creative visuals, ego loss, and loss of contact with reality, which collectively I'm going to call VER. The reason I've uh, collected these three specific most dramatic uh, psychedelic effects is because these three effects are very reliably rendered in uh, uh, published uh, experience reports, which are the bread and butter, the raw natural history data of my uh, study. So loss of contact with reality only requires high serotonin 7. Uh, when the creative productions of the serotonin system become more salient than actual reality, we pass through a mental event horizon. We go beyond the veil. We experience a discontinuity in mental space and time. The mind can become a cornucopia. A mental big bang may occur, creating worlds, universes. So the serotonin 7 spectrum has a discontinuity, an event horizon, or the veil. Uh, normally, consciousness provides us with imagination, visualization, uh, representation uh, uh, of the world, but as we approach uh, higher levels, the contents become very tangible. When you're right on the threshold with a, a, a foot in both worlds, you experience derealization where the actual world maybe seemed to be made of paper or cheap plastic. When you go beyond that uh, 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 horizon, you lose contact with reality and, and you may be in a formless void or an alternate reality. Uh, I believe this uh, beyond the veil is where schizophrenia lies and just this side of the veil in, 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 in the unmedicated state would be where we find creativity and genius. And the, the old adage that there's a fine line between genius and, and madness uh, seems to be quite true. Ego loss requires high serotonin 7 and low serotonin 2. The three ego loss drugs are LSD, psilocybin, and 5-methoxy-DMT. We can achieve high serotonin 7, low serotonin 2 in two ways. Uh, in either case, we need high affinity and activity for serotonin, but either with low affinity for serotonin 2, as in 5-methoxy-DMT, or low activation of serotonin 2, as in LSD and psilocin. So most psychedelics, when they uh, act at serotonin 2, they activate it at about the same strength as uh, serotonin itself does, so about 100% of serotonin. But LSD's activation of serotonin 2 is somewhere between zero and a quarter that of serotonin, and psilocin's activation is somewhere between a quarter and half that of serotonin. So that creates one of the conditions. Uh, here I have the relative affinity of each drug at the three serotonin 2 receptors, uh, and the left column is the max of the three, so let's just look at the left column. You can see that 5-methoxy-DMT is in a class all by itself. It has less, it, it has less than half the affinity for uh, serotonin 2 as any of the other psychedelic drugs, and it's well below the limit of perceptibility. So here's the resting state. We have uh, the serotonin 7 consciousness represented by the brain. Here's the little hand uh, for serotonin 2. Take 5-methoxy-DMT and you expand consciousness, but notice that the hand doesn't change because all of the uh, affinities at serotonin 2 are well below the perceptible level. This is a moderate dose. If we take a higher dose, uh, this dopamine becomes perceptible and this is where God comes into play. But in any case, you feel as a drop in the ocean. Let's compare this with DMT. Now, I'm only looking at serotonin 2 here. DMT is very complex, but all of its serotonin 2 actions are well above the limit of perceptibility, so we increase the strength of the hand in DMT, but not 5-methoxy-DMT. You get ego loss uh, when serotonin 7 expands without expanding serotonin 2, but if you expand the two together, you tend not to get ego loss. So the egoic sense of self apparently emerges from the act of serotonin 2 shaping serotonin 7. Where serotonin 7 is too, too strong for serotonin 2, the sense of self can melt away. We experience ego loss. We can feel as a drop in the ocean. Open-eyed creative visuals requires both depth and breadth. I'm going to read a series of, of reports with successively increasing higher uh, affinity at serotonin 7 in drugs with uh, some breadth to them. <clears throat> so here, 2CE, uh, Sasha describes, When I lay on my bed, I saw myself as an old, old man, many years in the future. I was appalled to see my forearm as a withered, dry-skinned, almost bone, which could only be that of someone dying. I looked down at the rest of me, and I was thin, emaciated, brittle, shallow. Now, he was actually laying in bed. He was actually looking at his body, but he was seeing it in a dramatically transformed 
performed away. This is the creative visual that serotonin 7 produces in combination <clears throat> with other mental organs. LSD <clears throat> takes the relative affinity of serotonin 7 to a much higher level. The subject is out on the street in Greenwich Village, sees an old lady in her 70s uh, walking towards him. She began to lose years. I saw her as an Italian matriarch in her 60s, then her 50s, and she continued to bloom backwards in time, all the way to an infant, shrank into a newborn baby carried by a midwife. The baby's umbilical cord was still intact, and it let out a howl of awakening life. But then the process was reversed, and the baby grew back into childhood, became again a bride, passed through her 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and was the old lady in her 70s. I had seen at the beginning. The old woman blinked, her eyes closed for a fraction of a second, uh, and in that instant I clearly saw her death max. Now that's an even more dramatic transformation. He actually saw the old lady on the street, but his, his serotonin 7 system is dramatically transforming this. This reaches the limit where serotonin 7 is the best hit of the drug, as in DMT. You can have an alternate reality, an infinite hive. There are insect-like intelligences everywhere in a hyper-technological space. I think you know the story. Um, <laughs> So DMT is the, is the one drug that simultaneously has the highest breadth, uh, the highest depth, and the highest breadth of consciousness. So DMT, uh, you, it, it, it expands serotonin 7, it expands serotonin 2, but at the same time it loads lots of content mental organs into consciousness, and this is where the alternate reality comes from. Compared to, to 5-methoxy-DMT, it doesn't load anything into consciousness, so, that, so you get a formless void. In order to get creative visuals, you need content. In order to get an alternate reality, you need content. Uh, DMT provides that, 5-methoxy-DMT doesn't. So, uh, I trained blind raiders to recognize the presence or absence of open-eyed creative visuals, ego loss, or loss of contact with reality in uh, written experience reports. They evaluated 250 reports ac across 22 drugs. We did it twice, once with 24 blind raiders, once with 19 blind raiders. The results were the same. Uh, in either case, there was, uh, the VER ratings were highly bimodal, and they separated, it, separated into a group of uh, 10 high VER drugs and 12 low VER drugs. When we plot VER against relative affinity at serotonin 7, it perfectly separates high VER drugs from low VER drugs with no exception. If we plot serotonin 2 against VER, any of the three serotonin 2 receptors or combinations of them, there's no separation whatsoever of high VER drugs from low VER drugs. And I think this is strong evidence that serotonin 7, not serotonin 2, is responsible for the most dramatic effects of psychedelic drugs, at least VER. So, for those who embrace the serotonin 2 paradigm in its simplicity, I hope that I've planted some doubt that it's a productive way of looking at the psychedelic process. Uh, here's my sources of support, my contact information, and this work was uh, published on Tuesday by Transform Press. <laughs>